So welcome, though. I appreciate you all coming. We, we have a very interesting talk that's going to focus on uh, health system preparedness and issues specifically related to COVID, but a bigger picture issue of, in general, our preparedness. Um, we're going to use the team from Mount Sinai Hospital to talk about their efforts during COVID, and then I, I work for the federal government. We're going to talk about some of the federal efforts going forward for hospital and health system preparedness. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Um, to my immediate right is Brendan Carr, an old colleague who used to be a Fed, who's currently the Systems Chair and Professor of Emergency Medicine from Mount Sinai. Uh, next to him is Alex Zabrowski. She's Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Sinai. Then there's Michael Redlener, Associate Professor and Medical Director in Emergency Medicine. And finally, Laura, Laura Ivacoli, who's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of New York Health and Hospitals, New York City Health and Hospitals, and Elmhurst Hospital Emergency Physician and Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we're going to start with uh, Brendan. We are. So uh, we're going to start with quick disclosures, which is to say that the Fed says the least because uh, he can get in the most trouble if he says it. And the rest of us, although we did some contract work with the Uniform Services University, uh, that was Tom Kirsch, by the way. I think he may have not introduced himself. Uh, um, previously at Hopkins and has been at the Uniform Services University for several years. We did some contract work with them about uh, what happened during COVID in New York, which is how we got to, to work with each other and to start down this pathway. Um, and there really, other than that contract work, which has now ended, there aren't uh, conflicts of interest. So this is briefly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, um, about what was, you know, what was in place to sort of be built ahead of time, what happened uh, boots on ground when the surge happened in March. And then we're going to identify three key things which sort of tell the story of important pieces of the puzzle that are going to need to come together, at least through our lens, if we're going to have a, a more prepared system. Uh, and then we'll talk about sort of what that, what that might look like moving forward. Um, I'm not, this is like, you know, several hours worth of talk um, that I'm not going to give. These are existing federal programs. When we think about readiness and the degree to which the health system is ready to absorb something, uh, it would be great if there was a stitched together perfect narrative. There isn't really. Um, there are a bunch of programs that are trying to align themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the, and I'm sure you know, many in the room know some of these programs. One of the punchlines at the bottom here um, is that you know, it's a very, very modest amount of money relative to the size of the healthcare system. And we always, so I, Tom said I used to be a Fed. I worked for eight years inside of HHS at ASPR, which is the home for many of these programs. And, um, and we always said, we're never going to be able to grant ourselves towards preparedness. We need to figure out a better, smarter way. What was in, uh, so when I left government, um, I, took, I moved, came to Sinai February 2020. Um, uh, and I worked in the government until, you know, sort of the day before that. This is what we were trying to put together pre-surge. These programs that I just showed you at the local and state level um, are pieces of the puzzle. We wanted them blended into the pieces that exist in our world, our regular world, trauma centers and pediatric subspecialty hospitals and uh, you know, maybe radiation oncologists all have a, a network of hospitals, whether you know it or not, that think about what they would do if people got irradiated uh, because they're the ones, it turns out, that have the domain expertise in that space, et cetera, et cetera. So these specialty pieces needed to be stitched together, and they needed to be stitched together with um, two things in particular. One was uh, this thing that we'll talk about a little bit called the Regional Disaster Health Response System. Uh, and the second one is a partnership with the military, thus um, the DOD um, at the table here with us in the form of Tom and their interest in building this bridge between, uh, between federal government and private sector. Uh, I'm going to hand to Laura Ivacoli quickly. So Laura is a Sinai faculty, but Laura really in her real life um, is, uh, is a doc at Elmhurst and ran emergency management for all of the public hospitals during the surge. Hi. So yes, I'm going to tell uh, the story about how New York City Health and Hospitals, and particularly Elmhurst, became the epicenter of the epicenter um, pretty much for the entire world. So just to tell you a little bit about New York City Health and Hospitals, we are a public hospital system in New York City. We are the largest municipal healthcare system in the United States. We serve 1.4 million patients, 500,000 of which are uninsured. And we provide translation in 190 <coughs> languages. We have 11 acute care hospitals, five post-acute, six diagnostic and treatment centers, and over 70 community-based primary care centers. And 
As Brendan said, I was the clinical emergency management director at Elmhurst during wave one, and then they asked me to transition into the senior assistant vice president for emergency management for the system uh, for wave two and onward. So what happened at Elmhurst? I mean, we were uh, you know, in the media a lot. Uh, basically, we saw an uptick in, so what is that? We saw an uptick in uh, infectious uh, disease symptoms, flu-like symptoms presenting to Elmhurst in February. Um, as we know, there was no testing. We had a pretty good idea after the Westchester outbreak that it was on our shores. So a single case turned into just a tidal wave of COVID. It was really a brutal onslaught. Then we became the epicenter of the epicenter of the entire world. Um, we would literally, as you guys all probably did as well, intubate, code, intubate. Um, it was you know, like a war scene pretty much at the hospital. Described by the military when they got there as the closest thing to civ civilian warfare as they'd ever seen. So we had the first case in New York at uh, March 1st. Uh, the pandemic was declared worldwide March 11th. And before March 11th, uh, we knew what was going on even though we couldn't prove it and we tried to cohort all of our uh, ILI patients into our pretty large square foot uh, fast track that quickly got overwhelmed. We moved to a bigger space, that got overwhelmed and we declared the whole ED a hot zone so nobody could get in or out of the emergency department without putting on PPE fully and doffing the PPE when they left. And this was before anybody really even was let, letting anybody mask because of the optics of it and because we would scare patients. Our new fast track, our big fast track that had 12 uh, beds in it, housed 60 standing room only uh, patients. Another large room that had 14 beds had 80. Our recess area that has seven beds had 22 pretty quickly critically ill patients. Uh, on March 18th, we had 225 patients in the emergency department. The entire hospital was an all COVID, all critical care hospital. We were packed to the gills. We had 120 in triage, waiting to be triaged. Ambulances, as you can see, a picture were lined up down the street trying to drop off patients. There was not a single space in there. You couldn't see the floor in the entire emergency department. 140 patients were admitted in the emergency department, all on life-sustaining oxygen with zero beds upstairs. 40 of them were on CPAP high flow, intubated, and we were caring for them for days and weeks on end. So something had to be done. Our ambulatory care leads stood up a testing tent at the emergency department entrance, and we quickly started doing uh, quick MTALA screens at uh, triage, and we were moving 200 patients a day to the testing tent who were really there as worried well. Um, and we were, they were getting uh, community PCR testing there. And we also implemented a sorter at triage. So there was a line down the block of patients waiting to come in and be seen. Um, so we put a sorter at triage that did an EMTALA screen. We would go up and down that line and pull out patients that are hypoxic and critically ill and pull them into the emergency department. We, in, in the emergency department, we created teams such as transport teams, oxygen teams, oxygen tank teams, proning teams, vent teams, and we just moved through the patients uh, in a circular fashion to make sure that everybody was well cared for. So that's the Elmhurst story, and I'm gonna pass it off to Brenda to tell the Mount Sinai story. So ju just to sort of, as a reference point, um, you know, so Sinai is a, a big health system, biggest health system in Manhattan, um, other than the public system. Um, and, uh, you know, we see half a million patients a year and uh, have eight emergency departments that expend, not just on Manhattan, but Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, um, and run two residency programs. The, um, the ED side of the story, I think most of us know, and you certainly heard from Elmhurst. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what was happening, because one of the pieces I said we think we need to have visibility on is, yes, what's coming, situation awareness around what's coming, but also around capacity within a region. So. Um, that, that sort of little, uh, that little bar graph, not that bar graph there that gives me chest pain that you think is a bar graph, uh, you know, that's, that's just the rate of rise and you see how quickly it happened. It was, was really quite something, um, you know, the, and, then, and then it hung for a very long time. The, the purple or blue, whatever that is, are people with COVID, the, sorry, the darker, and then the light blue are people that were waiting for their tests to come back. They're sort of waiting in the ER. I'm sure you had similar things. I just want to share two pictures. That, the, the lobby, if you've ever been to the Mount Sinai Hospital on the Upper East Side, um, is a very, very fancy thing made by a very, very ar uh, fancy architect with a, a giant glass ceiling. 
Uh, and those are rooms being constructed in the, in the middle of the lobby where there's usually a grand piano and then off to the right there. You know, those are every night, you know, the, we would, it was like a race between the, the, the patients and engineering. They're knocking out windows and putting in uh, sheetrock or, or, or um, plywood uh, and those holes there are, you know, are to, are to uh, install a HEPA filter and blow it out and then ultimately you know, the first case was March 1 in the city at the Upper East Side Hospital that I just showed you, and by April 1, we were so uh, overwhelmed that, you know, uh, we opened that we, in partnership with Samaritan's First, opened that field hospital. That is the, uh, if you can see the cursor there, but, you know, this is our big tower. This is our, our, our kids' hospital and our, and our, what used to be, you know, sort of women's and children's, which is still where OB lives, and this is the East Meadow sitting in front of the park. Pretty dramatic um, that we would need that, that, that need that much extra space. That 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 facility ended up. They were 68 medical beds and 10 ICUs, and they ended up treating almost 200 patients. Uh, the story wouldn't be complete, especially given that we're talking about our dance with the federal government, without talking about what was happening in the city um, from the pr government's perspective. As the comfort rolled in past the Statue of Liberty, I mean, this picture, uh, you know, at least for those of us who were living at the time, just made it sink in that we were we were in way way over our heads. Ultimately, the Comfort treated uh, about the same number of patients as the field hospital in front of our hospital. The Javits treated 1,100, but if you remember back, there was significant controversy that the Javits wouldn't take anybody, the Comfort wouldn't take anybody that had COVID, and the Javits wouldn't take anybody um, that had uh, an oxygen requirement. And when we had, you know, one of the consultants that came in from emergency management, this is the quote that they said, and it just sort of stuck with me. They said, why did they build a hurricane shelter? And, you know, it's not a jab at the government. The government was doing what, what they, what they knew how to do, they were building capacity, uh, but it was it didn't fit the, the need, and we will circle back around to that. So I want to bridge into the three different domains that we wanted to highlight about uh, what we think is needed and what might help us to sort of change the game on getting there. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Alexis Zabrowski. That's not true. And I'm going to introduce Laura <laughs> Ivacoli. <who you're> <laughs> We are going to get to the other speakers, I promise I'll go quick. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some clinical operations and level loading, and then Alexis will talk about data and modeling, and then we'll get into uh, clinical care and crisis standards of care uh, by Dr. Redliner. So what did we learn coming out of wave one? Uh, we did learn that we had to stand up a lot of things within the system, situational awareness, our multi-agency coordination group and emergency operations center that oversaw the system's coordination, and most importantly, our system surge plan. Uh, we, the data systems that uh, Alexis is going to touch on that were so, so integral to every other wave's response, but they just weren't there during that first wave. Um, this is our level loading dashboard that came out of the first wave so that you could see the level of strain in any one facility and in a facility that was black or red, uh, we would offload them. This was something that we didn't have in the first wave. Uh, in the first wave, we did start level loading at Elmhurst on March 25th, ultimately transferred 200 patients out. Uh, through April 18th, um, but became much more sophisticated as a system coming out of wave one. And this is our surge beds and surge staffing plans that went along with this. So each facility had their A, B, and C surge staffing plans. Um, and along with the, you know, a bed is a bed is a bed unless you have staff to staff the bed. So we had our staffing plans that went along with it, and depending on how many patients were showing up at their doors and what the modeling was showing, we'd bring beds online and get staff in to staff them uh, in preparation for the surge that the modeling was showing that was coming, uh, which again, uh, Alexis will talk about modeling shortly that really played into, uh, into the response after wave one. So there was a podcast on July 27th, 2020 by Michael Barbaro. Uh, this is the name of the podcast and what it really highlighted was the disparities in social inequities in healthcare that the pandemic brought to light. Um, and the lessons learned out of this podcast, if you, if you really listen to it and, and think about what are we getting out of this podcast, is that we really need to work better as systems. Uh, we need to expand upon the walls, break down walls between systems and institutions. Uh, we need to work around institutional pressures. We need to develop uh, coordinated inter-system transfers, uh, plan for a centralized citywide command center, help hospitals and health systems communicate and share resources during crises, and implement accurate and consistent data sharing uh, and manage data across silos. I mean, we did this well within systems. We still have some work to do between systems. And with that, I'm going to move to Alexis so she can talk about the data.
Great, so like Laura said and, and Brendan alluded to before, um, there was a lot of information that uh, each system or each hospital was collecting on their own, but these were done sort of in silos. So uh, up here we have examples of dashboards that were created both for health and hospitals and for uh, the Mount Sinai system. And the hospitals were collecting data on things like number of cases, uh, number of beds, patients that were seen in the EDs. And this helped sort of create a picture locally, but a big sort of point of contention was that there were no uh, sharing of data between the systems. Uh, again, on a national scale, there was data being collected and one of the big uh, pieces of information that were brought out of COVID was the um, HHS Protect uh, dashboard. And what you could see with both uh, case rates and vaccination rates nationally, and also the amount of uh, beds and uh, resources being utilized across the country. But this information was often delayed, there were a lot of inaccuracies, and it was hard to really uh, create actionable items from the information being shared because it was at such a high level. So we sort of had local level data and national level data, but not something in between where systems could work together to level load or to uh, uh, share the information in an actionable way. Uh, similarly, um, in some of the local municipalities, um, particularly in NYC where uh, all of us are located, uh, there was a lot of modeling with the case rates uh, to try to help systems and public health departments try to figure out what was going on and what was coming next. So um, as case reports were, uh, or cases were reported, uh, there was modeling happening to try to estimate what could be expected. And then this data was used by the hospital systems uh, in planning. So for what could be expected for patient census, for critical care census, uh, and particularly the local rates could be used to think about uh, beds that might be needed in the future and how many patients we might be able to expect moving forward. Uh, another important piece of this modeling was to think about uh, how many patients in your community might have immunity um, and therefore how that might impact uh, what could be coming in both uh, the next couple of days and next waves. Uh, in addition, there was a lot of national modeling happening, uh, especially in some of the early waves and in the more recent waves like the Omicron wave, to try to anticipate where hotspots might be. Uh, when you think about some of the staffing uh, issues that happened like for nurses or for doctors and some of the travelers uh, that were being used, there was modeling happening try to, to try to anticipate both where bed shortages would happen and where some of the staffing shortages would occur. And so uh, along with some of the estimates for how case rates might be uh, increasing, there was uh, modeling happening to look to see how those case rates coincided with what was available at hospitals in any given location. And uh, you know, the news and, and a lot of different places were reporting uh, what might be expected and working, trying to work with the government and other uh, systems to see if things like field hospitals or uh, other resources could uh, be built prior to uh, what, um, to the surge that was occurring. I'll turn it over to Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I just ask, how many people work in the emergency department? Okay. All right. Yeah. No. I understand. I understand. So, that my, I guess um, the perspective that I'm going to take um, on this subject is really as a frontline provider <coughs> and as somebody who is an administrative operations uh, person on the ground during the pandemic. How many people have taken care of a COVID patient? Right. <laughs> right. So, so I think this um, this is a an article uh, in the New York Magazine about one of our Mount Sinai hospitals, Mount Sinai, Brooklyn. It tells the story of a hospital that's overwhelmed, a 212-bed hospital that, um, you know, with a 12-bed ICU that was taking care of 51 intubated patients uh, at a time, had 36 codes in one day uh, during the, the peak of this, uh, of this pandemic. And it tells the story of how, essentially how the system saved the hospital from being totally shut down, totally overwhelmed. And so 
you know, I think about the provide, like I, I work in Manhattan at, at one of the Manhattan hospitals for the Mount Sinai Health System, and this was going on, and I think it spurred a lot of discussion and, and thinking around, well, what happens when we get to the end of our ability to care for patients that we need to care for? And so from my, my perspective on this is really as a frontline provider, thinking about what I would do faced with no, not the resources to take care of patients. So I, I think that one of the things that I think is essential in how we think about this is really related to um, how do we care for the, the frontline providers? And I, I think Tom, Tom Kirsch really helped me crystallize this idea of moral distress, right, which is, you know, we're put in a position where we don't, you know, either have the, 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 the clinical tools, the equipment, or, and we don't necessarily have the ethical approach to how to, how to treat patients in this setting. So um, this is one of those things that you can't do as a frontline provider, no, no matter how, how hard we try in the emergency department, right, where we, we, you know, can't make a decision, an ethical decision on the fly about who we're going to take care of and who we're not going to take care of. And so I think that's, an, you know, kind of with all of these clinical operations things and data that, we, that we've discussed already, what is it that we, you know, are going to do as a society and as a system, as an emergency department, uh, to, to take care of patients when there's, we have to make, you know, do clinical triage, essentially. There are, there's a lot of work done. If you haven't read uh, the uh, National Academy of Science or the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, Crisis Standards of Care, it's, a, it's an excellent framework for thinking about how to, how to, you know, build an ethical system in the setting of disasters in, in low resources. Uh, it's something that has uh, been discussed and debated a lot in society. It came out of the, the, uh, the H1N1 uh, uh, flu uh, problem, um, I guess it's uh, so epidemic. And so I think that it's important to understand that this was a great framework, but like when we're actually going through uh, this you know, COVID experience, we have, it really made us think more deeply about these problems. And so in New York State, we have some tools there. This is a document by a woman named Tia Powell, who's an ethicist and a, and a physician. And um, it talks really about um, ventilator allocation. But the, you know, one, it was focused only on ventilator allocation. Two, it used tools that weren't necessarily useful for emergency physicians who had to make decisions in real time without more clinical data than you had at your fingertips. And then, uh, and three, like even in the EMS setting, there was decisions that had to be made and, and discussed. And so, you know, with, there wasn't really an effective tool to deal with this whole kind of system-based thinking. And I think we need to really think um, more clearly about how do we build this tool that's integrated with the, the societal response in, in, a, in a, a public health emergency. And so, um, John Hick and, and Dan Hamfling, and we ha I think we had an opportunity to talk with them after the first wave of the pandemic, but they wrote this paper in, in March of 2020 in anticipation during the, the rise to, to, um, uh, to the pandemic. And I think it's, it's, it's an excellent, also an excellent document and also worth reading to think about how you approach, like, how, what is our responsibility as a society to get these things ready so that we can implement them? Uh, what, you know, should we have to have to deal with it? And it was really timely in terms of dealing with the, the pandemic. And so, again, I, I think I'll just go back to this. This is from the original IOM report, but it's really, yeah, how do you conceptualize these things? And I, I think it relates to the, 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 the work that Brendan did at ASPR uh, to think about how do you prepare a society to, to deal with a pandemic or a public health emergency that overwhelms resources even a re, in, a, in a resource rich environment. And how do we think about it? How do we prepare for it? Um, and how do we get all of the pieces right so it's working uh, to support not only the clinical care, but like the frontline providers, the people that are doing the work, that, so that you know, the system works to support the, the work of patient care and, and, and our ability to really take care of the people in our society in general. So you know, I think that, that you know, the, the operation, the clinical operations, the, the data that supports it and, and you know, uh, a kind of a guide to support clinical decision making during a, a disaster is really important and pieces of what we need to do and it, you know, pieces of what uh, the federal government needs to support in order to, or every level of government and um, we as providers really need to think about and support in, you know, in kind of in an effort to really address uh, the clinical care that we can provide during uh, public health emergencies. So I'll turn it back over to uh, to Brendan to go through the next phase. Yeah, 
Because, I mean, I guess I would say, just to add my two cents to that, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you're alone making a decision without anybody supporting you, of course you're capable of that, right? You do it all the time, every day. But when we're at crisis standards, I would sort of say the system has already failed. The notion that crisis standards are only effective 9 to 5 when the ethics committee comes and looks at the patient in the ICU and makes a decision doesn't fly in this crowd, right? Like, we expect some sort of a real-time ability to, to calibrate and the moral distress associated by making you decide to intubate, not to intubate, sort of to allocate, um, I think is, is, is a failure of the system, and, and it's our job to, to solve for that. So the other thing that I was thinking as Michael was talking is about who owns it. Because right now you've heard, you know, you heard Alexis say, um, we're good at national, national good-ish at national data. We sort of built that plane while we were flying. Um, we we're good at our own data. You saw our dashboards. You saw the dashboards from the H&H &H system. I'm sure, you know, you have sort of similar dashboards. We don't, we're a competitive marketplace, though, and we don't play all that nice with our competitors, including, even though it's a public system and we should be nicer to them, including health and hospital. We don't have to be nice to the private systems. We have it written into the bylaws that we can be as nasty as we want to NYP and NYU. And, um, but, it's, but, you know, it's a real thing that we're competing. Our health systems think about competition. They hang billboards. They compete for cancer care. They want orthopedics and cardiac surgery. Um, and then all of a sudden, we want full transparency around who's got an empty bed that I can transfer a patient to independent of insurance, and it just didn't fly when we needed it to fly. So I showed you this before, and I just want to take a minute to unpack it again um, so about some of these programs, uh, because we're gliding into, it's like, it's sort of now or never, at least in my mind. We're never gonna get a wake up call like we just got. It was very hard to get bandwidth and attention and interest around this topic pre-pandemic. I feel already it fading, you know, in, in, in the efforts. But here's the framework that, that, you know, I don't even know, by the way, this if this is, uh, we presented this all over the place uh, as right before I left government, and this is where we were going to go. So these programs on the left here, the local and state ones, right, they don't, they don't really engage for the most part with healthcare systems all that much, although HPP does some, um, uh, and, they do, and they don't, they're not great about crossing state lines. Specialty services are, are often carve-outs, right? We all sort of know what those are. Uh, you know, some trauma centers believe that they have a regional presence and they're giving consultation to, and education to community hospitals surrounding them that they're going to take referrals from. Most are doing that a little bit less robustly than they might otherwise do. They're mostly saying, yes, we'll take your transfer. My two cents on it. Um, uh, and then on the third here is where everybody was kind of hoping that we would build the special sauce, which is to say, to figure out how you can create regional awareness um, and regional partnerships that allow us to decide when we break the glass, we will share our data with NYP, with NYU, with the public system, so that we can make sure that nobody sort of is, uh, is, is left uh, in an environment where they can't be taken care of in the middle of the night with you um, deciding whether or not you're gonna, uh, what you're gonna be able to do for them. So at the time, and I'll come, and I'll come back, so that's the Regional Disaster Health Response System, uh, and and, and uh, Tom's going to talk to you about the the, 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 and the the pilot happening with the DoD. So this is this is a little bit. The, the, so the three black ones are the ones that existed pre-COVID. Um, this is uh, Mass General, Nebraska, and the and the Denver Health Regional Systems. And the little for those of you who don't speak Fed, those colors and states that are like bunched together. That's how the federal government thinks of us as regions. You think of like the three counties around you where stroke patients go, or maybe you think like that. Um, they think in terms of multi-state regions that are the way that they're administratively organized inside of the federal government. Um, so those so regions eight, seven, and one had the beginnings, had a pilot program. This is, it sounds like a lot of money, maybe. I don't know, it depends, I guess, on your reference of, uh, your frame of reference. Three million dollars for your first year and then like a million and a half for something thereafter to align the way that you think about response across all those states and hospitals. Doesn't really, really, yeah, right, I'm with you. It doesn't say, that's, uh, who, it feels weird saying $3 million is not a lot of money. Uh, and then uh, last year, Emory received the fourth pilot program. Um, uh, and, and we'll see, I mean, the goal is to sort of create a, a coalition, um, a, a system, an RDHRS um, for each of the uh, HHS regions, or at least that was the plan. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't get the playbook anymore. Uh, and this is what they're doing, just to sort of break it down. Capability one, build the, build the network, build the system, create the relationships, build the governance, whatever it might be, know how to, how to, how to interact with the people that you're going to need uh, to interact with if push comes to shove. Two is align your plans and your policies. Just try to get on the same page-ish so you can speak the same language. 
Three is around uh, medical surge capacity. How are you going to do it? What's the plan for it? Where are you going to create capacity? What are you going to do about workforce? Four is data, right? How do you get situational awareness so that you understand where you are, where you're likely to go, and, and what you're going to do when next comes? Uh, and then five is, is to sort of exercise it, right? What are the metrics and how do you exercise it? it you know, I mean, it's a, it's a nice logical flow. It is really hard to do, and it's a long game for sure, but it's an important game. Um, the one other piece that I'm going to sort of call out, I'll go back actually, that uh, priority to that top one, there was a system of care built after uh, Ebola that was sort of site-based. It was tiered. It was a multi-tiered structure. Identify the patients, you know, treat-ish or hold the patients a little bit, and then the definitive care facilities. Um, and it, had, it went by a lot of different names. That has all evolved into something that is not Ebola-specific. Um, and there is language that has been effectively written in already to sort of statute that's getting some dollars called the National Special Pathogen System of Care. NSPS is what they call themselves. There's a really nice series of articles written in Health Affairs talking about this. Uh, it, my bias is that it is a little bit too much like a specialty thing in the middle, um, in the way that it has started to get carved out by Congress. It's like uh, infectious disease doctors and ICU doctors. They don't want it to be that. They're trying to move it towards the one ring to rule them all, right? So that trauma can come and you know, rad, uh, radiation poisoning can come. Uh, we'll see where it lands. I have it over there in, in, in number three because we all want it to go there. But the minds of like legislators, it makes sense that ICUs and infectious disease doctors and pandemics are the words we should use because that's what just happened to us. Whereas you guys might think, but really it's all hazard. The person standing at the foot of the bed running the code or running the resuscitation or putting the orders in the computer matters significantly less than all of the other stuff, the capacity of the, of the room and the people in the room to take care of critically ill people. So the central structure is that there's a central body that coordinates things. There's key functions of sort of, you know, you see an alignment with some of the RDHRS stuff, data integration, this, that, the other. And then there's a tiered system uh, borrowed from burn and trauma and other things that allows you to understand how to refer patients sort of uh, upstream. But the other one on that was uh, a pilot with the National Disaster Medical System. We, although Tom was convinced we would be at six hours before we were done talking and said, I'll just blow past it, we have a little bit of time to unpack what NDMS is and what the pilot might be. So, I mean, you have an interesting overview of of little individual to very big here. And, and the reason this is a discussion, has really become a discussion in the last five or six years, is that a number of people realized a decade or so ago that if there's a real catastrophe in the U.S., we're screwed. <laughs> we, we are able to take care of the hurricane that drowns 18 and hurts 53 and, uh, you know, all the little stuff. Even, you know, people say, well, what about 9-11? Well, everyone was dead. The New York hospitals didn't get anyone. We have not in the history of our healthcare system been challenged by a real disaster. And yet, we, everyone in this room, have lived by through a disaster. And during COVID, our healthcare systems in various places around the country teetered on collapse. There are a number of healthcare systems that teetered on collapse. And COVID is a weenie stupid virus that even before we had treatments killed less than 0.5%. SARS, if that had gone up wide, killed 8.7%, 18 times as many people as COVID. Would our healthcare system have survived that? I, I don't have the answer to that. But there's other scenarios at the national level that we as federal government people use to plan for that have similar catastrophe levels. Bio is clearly one of them. Another one is an earthquake. The predicted casualties in an earthquake that occurs in Cascadia in Seattle or New Madrid near St. Louis or in LA or San Francisco are 100,000 injured people in three minutes. 22,000 to 26,000 who will require hospitalization and care when more than 50% of the hospitals in the area are, are taken out. Another scenario, a nuke suitcase in, a, in an urban area, Times Square, 100,000 dead. 89,000 dead. Oh. What's that? Well, that's where they did the last national planning scenario. <laughs> they blew up Times Square. So 
So, so there's real threats out there. And the final scenario, I, so I have to digress a bit. I'm Tom Kirsch, I'm an emergency physician. I run the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, um, which is an interagency disaster science center that's housed at the universe, Uniform Services University. And I spent most of my career doing disaster stuff, and particularly the last 10 years while I was at Hopkins, looking at health system preparedness and health system impact from earthquakes in particular. Did a lot of work modeling abilities of systems to provide care. So, so we understand that this is an issue. So under the auspices of, of ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the Department of Health and Human Services, the DOD, there was a law passed that required the DOD to do this NDMS pilot, which the National Center got handed to. And it's a, um, a five-year-long pilot, $15 million a year, and the purpose of it is to see if our healthcare systems, if we can fix them, to make them ready for a catastrophe. Right? It's a good question. Um, because it's DOD money, of course, the powers that be within the Department of Defense rejected any scenario that wasn't DOD specific. So the pilot is using a scenario, which is the other big catastrophe that we don't, aren't well prepared for, which is an over serious conflict with a, what we call a near peer adversary. The, one of the big kids, basically, which is projected, and some of it's classified, but at a minimum to cause a, a thousand casualties um, a day that will be transported back to the U.S. and require definitive care and treatment. And that could go on for, if you, I mean, you look at Ukraine, you see how it's going in Ukraine. Um, and it was projected that Russia lost as many as 15,000 dead and three times as many injured in the first 60 days of that conflict against what was not a near peer adversary. So it's a, it's a big deal for us, all of us. So the pilot, um, we chose five sites to work at. We were mandated by Congress to work at five sites. These are the five sites. Two of them happen to be RDHRS sites that are, are ASPR sites. The pilot, even though it's a DOD site, we actually have a body of uh, senior level um, leaders as well as working class folks like me from five different agencies who help coordinating the pilot. The pilot is, uh, um, led by the National Center, um, and the money, ironically, is research dollars, even though we're trying to fix a system. And I work at the Fed now, and I've learned all kinds of acronyms and all kinds of weird rules. So we're doing research, and so we're doing operational and systems level research at five different sites to identify optimum ways to care for the sick. And to digress a little bit on the NDMS, so the National Disaster Medical System, everyone knows about the DMAT teams, right? That's the NDMS, the DMAT teams. Well, in fact, the NDMS was stood up during the 80s to, be, to prepare our nation for a war with Russia and Europe. And the, the original core component of that was supposed to be the hospital-based care, which has got little attention, no funding, and basically little work going forward. And so our focus is not on DMAT teams, not on transporting patients, it's organizing the care for NDMS casualty patients. Um, and so that's kind of what we're doing going forward. I don't want to spend much more time because I want to get to questions. Um, but I think that one thing that we've learned from COVID now, and, and now we've been working with multiple different healthcare systems, working with the University of Nebraska Medical System in Omaha, working with the Denver Health in Denver, um, working with um, the Trauma Coalition down in uh, San Antonio, which includes a military hospital called Brooks Army Medical Center. Um, and so the COVID waves that we've all struggled through, the, the ways that we chose to surge our staff stuff, systems and space, and all of those things are powerful lessons learned. And so Mount Sinai has really done a tremendous job describing very specific things that can be done on a very short notice in order to develop surge capacity, which is what this is all about. If there's an earthquake, we're going to have 100,000 injured people, which will have to be transported across the country to get care. And those hospital systems where they're transported to are going to have to open their doors up immediately within, you know, one to three days in order to take that surge of patients. And so this is, again, a big, big uh, issue for all of us. And, and I welcome your um, questions for anyone in the group, and we'll go from there. Could I clarify one thing that sounded crazy to me the first time I heard it when I sat in rooms with DOD types after a decades long career in the civilian sector? What he just said is that, you know, with North Korea, China, Russia, ground war somewhere, Europe, Asia, 
the plan is for those patients to be medevaced to civilian hospitals. I, I mean, I don't know if, like, if right. people think about that all the time, because the DOD, the VA, do not have capacity. Right? The, the are, capacity of the VA and DOD can be counted, if you cleared out everything, in high hundreds of beds. Not thousands, not tens of thousands, high hundreds. And that's not if we're deploying all of our doctors and nurses forward to the war. And Tom and I could go deep on all the reasons that this plan is challenged, but one of them for the you know, administrative wonks in you, one of them is that you're talking about low margin stuff. You're talking about like wound care, right? Trauma, stuff that a lot of hospitals don't want. And you're talking about uh, Medicare rates plus a 15% bump, is that right? 10% for now. 10% bump. Right. Oh, but the, but the Department of Defense is only going to pay TRICARE rates. No TRICARE problem. rates, which gets you like nowhere near. <laughs> Y'all know how TRICARE rates You know, rates cancer suck. patients and thoracic surgical patients and all the things that you know get the priorities in your hospitals while the emergency department has lower margin patients waiting for beds, right? And, you know, so the connection between the capacity in the healthcare system, the prioritization of high margin cases, boarding in the emergency department, all of these issues that are central to emergency medicine, like, the, this is the use case that gets the attention of people that when we show up and say, but there's crowding and boarding and it's not fair. Uh, you know, like I don't, we're not winning that battle for the last 20 years that I've been a part of that battle. This is the window, right? We are not ready. There's a fundamental threat to the capacity of the United States to be able to take a punch because of business as usual. And there's financial underpinnings to that. Um, and, 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 and maybe there's a mechanism by which to sort of change the game on that. As I said, though, and then let's really let's, let's see if we can open up to discussion. Um, uh, you know, my take on this is that the window's closing already. There's an act circulating through the Senate right now, the P Prevent Pandemics Act. Uh, there was so much excitement about what it was going to do. It is a public health act. It doesn't use the word critical care. It doesn't use the word health system. It doesn't use the word, you know, hospital capacity. It doesn't use the word emergency medicine. It is a. It's all about like supply chain, and it's about diagnostics, and it's about manufacturing pharmaceutical products, and it's about public health systems. It is not about the fundamental challenge, uh, you know, that, that we're faced with when we go to work every day. I was supposed to end upbeat somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pilot, and Tom's got money to fix it. Let's, let's have questions. Does anybody have any well questions? That wants to talk to any of this? I can bring you a microphone. They tell us that even though we can scream at each other, they're recording it, so the mics are helpful. Uh, this is like a two-part question. The first is like going back to the level loading kind of thing that you were doing, where you know black, red, everything like that. Did you find yourself at the point where that just was a moot point? Everything was black, everything was red. There was no point in moving the patients, right? Um, and then after that, I have a follow-up. So when Elmhurst got hit really we were the first hospital in the U.S. to really get hit that hard. So there was capacity. And when there were you know, ambulances lined up down the street trying to drop off patients into our ER that you couldn't see the floor, there were thousands of beds in the region that were open. Um, yeah, so you know, just the protocols of EMS, which is not your question, but um, you know, have come into question since, since that during a disaster and how they will um, not go to the nearest hospital and overwhelm the nearest hospital uh, in the future. But yeah, so we were able to, um, once we kind of got the ball rolling with the level loading, um, our sister facilities were able to decompress us pretty well. Um, and then come wave two, when we had the level loading dashboard up, um, we always found room. I mean, we weren't moving patients in, you know, the tens, twenties, you know, hundred batches that we were in wave one. Um, we were moving them probably in more in the tens, um, but we always got the capacity. We always found the space for them. It was it was tough though because you know we had the non-COVID and the COVID after wave one, um, and everybody was already full and <coughs> definitely challenging. This is a similar dashboard inside of the Sinai system and lots of level loading that was happening, um, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess I would say that did we find room or or did everything sort of turn? I think yours are black. I think ours are red. Maybe they're green. No, there's something. Like something happens. They turn like some orangey red. I can't remember what they are. Purple. Do they turn purple? They purple. turn purple. That's what happens. They go green, green, yellow, red, purple. Um, and so I, I, I think the answer is, um, yeah, they were all purple. I'm going to call out the guy in the back of the room. I mean, Ugo Zanquelli is runs 
the, our hospital in Queens, uh, and uh, man, they got, they got, there were times you couldn't decompress, even though we built a new hospital in Central Park, right? There, there were, I mean, I think there were times it was pretty ugly. Well, I, but I have sense you were going somewhere with that question. Hugo, you want to say anything? Or? Yeah. get them, having the help of the system it did help to sort of decompress things, but I will tell you it was a big challenge. You know, the first wave was definitely harrowing. Uh, the second wave was a little bit more manageable, but definitely that first wave left us all in awe, and after a few sort of days to almost like weeks, we were able to sort of solve the issues of level loading. Uh, but a huge challenge, and I will tell you that there were times where we were just like, where are these patients going to go? We had no place to put them upstairs. And you know we had to feel you know, and then I guess the uh, the federal government came up with a, a big big ship, and then but the criteria that they required for us to get patients into that ship was so limiting that we couldn't even get patients in there. So it was really a disaster. Well, we managed to get through it. Yeah. Yeah, were you going somewhere with that though? My sense was yeah. And now just as a time watch, we got uh, two three minutes. So then my other question, so we had the same issue. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a paramedic, I'm not a physician, um, but we were transporting patients up to 14 hours away to different FEMA regions to find them a bed. We were getting fixed wings in based on how the waves were coming through, right? And so my other question to that is, is there this thought or this initiative or this process of like federal coordination with regions when New York is overwhelmed and region four isn't, right? finding, helping to coordinate those beds and things like that because we were getting patients from Florida when we weren't and then sending people off to the Midwest and so, and I know that wasn't, we weren't unique in that, right? So just kind of, is there a thought there? You know, I, I think that, right, even in New York City alone, like with hospital systems down the block from one another that couldn't transfer to each other, like, I mean, there's building blocks that need to be made uh, locally, but I think that when you, when you solidify that that system to, to help it function, use the data from a regional perspective and start managing from that. I, I just think about what if we had all the systems that we have in place now at the beginning of the first wave? I mean, it would have been a different story. So, so I think that we need to build those systems locally and then figure out how they fit together. And like, I think that the RDHRS is totally an example of what, what could be. But, but I'll say you should grab Tom afterwards and talk about NDMS because one of the arms of NDMS is patient movement. Uh, there is, yeah, you will give him, you should do this at some event where there's a happy hour because it's going gonna, it's gonna to upset him just a little bit. Um, it's really tricky. The DOD is charged with patient movement um, through the NDMS, and they largely think of patient movement as a giant airplane that takes them from their ground war in York, remember why the system was built, to the United States. And you're drops, talking drops about. them on the tarmac. And they don't drop them on the tarmac. They, well, they wheel them out gently. They wheel them out carefully the, on the, the tarmac. Of the plane. And then pull them um, away. Yeah, so you're talking about something that's much more nuanced than that. And that actually, that where they're going to go, that part is owned by the VA, right? Because the VA has visits. They, they have a regional structure of their own, and they're supposed to have an understanding of what's happening in the civilian system as well as their system within that area. But then we all contract to the same EMS agencies, and it gets really messy really quick. And, and to add to that, that's what the RDHRS is about. So the, the trouble is the current NDMS, the distribution of patients is supposed to be made up by a federal dude who's going to go, okay, you go over there and you go over there, and not the hospitals. And, and that's just not going to work from my perspective as a civilian health care provider. And so RDHRS, as envisioned by the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness Response, is there will be a civilian lead hospital, particularly a trauma center, who is used to leading distribution of trauma care and stuff like that, who's going to coordinate within regions. And I personally think that's right. I don't know. We're going to test that hypothesis in our study. But it has to be a civilian co collaboration or coordination that's going to occur to distribute patients across civilian systems. It's the only way it's going to work, I think. And, and I think, again, we have tremendous lessons learned from a number of – across the country we're finding all kinds of places who during COVID – the local regional healthcare systems rose up together and created bed tracking and bed monitoring and ICU capacity levels and all kinds of ways that they could distribute the care across their regions. And it's been done across the country in multiple different ways. And I, th I think we're going to learn a lot from analyzing those different um, attempts to do that. I'm going to take one more to release you. We're at time. I will bring you a microphone. 
See, this guy is in between you and wherever you're going next. Um, for the crisis centers or carrier hospitals, do you feel that after the experience that you've had, do you have a better process to implement them and a better process to educate your personnel, your hospitals, um, based on, on what you've learned? Well, that's, I think, personally speaking, as a provider, not as a Fed, that we're all a little bit more open to some lessons. And so I, and, and working, you know, with, I work at George Washington Hospital in D.C. Um, the healthcare hospital and the healthcare system is, seems to be much more open. We've learned, though, we, in our first round of assessments of the NDMS hospitals, we went out and we surveyed a bunch of people, and we found out that most hospitals administrators don't even know that they've actually had their hospital sign up as an NDMS hospital. <laughs> they don't even know that. And then they have no idea what that actually means. And so there is clearly a need for some significant education about how this is going to work and how we're going to respond to this event. Um, and again, I, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think COVID really does give us an opportunity. And the lessons learned like from the Mount Sinai group, I think, are invaluable. And, and we're trying to collect similar lessons from sites around the country. I think on the pointy end of the implementation of crisis standards, though, we're really far from where we need to be. I think we're all alone, you know, uh, taking care of the patient because it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's not a light switch. You know, you can't just sort of, you know, they talk about, you know, conventional contingency cry. I mean, it's a continuum, uh, and there's not the, uh, there's great work being done on it. There's leaders, you know, that we can connect you to, but it is, uh, it's not all of a sudden there's a solution. Okay, it's fine to not do this for that person. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a great op place for people to we'll dig deep, I think, if they want an academic career in this space. Yeah. And, when, and is it a state question? Is it a health system question? You know, I mean, and I mean, I guess the only other piece that I'll say personally is that it was really scary and hard in New York that the press really wanted to know, you know, who did it? You know, who, who made a decision? Did, did this guy make a decision not to do something for somebody? Uh, and that blame culture, you know, as an administrator, picking pick up the pieces on that and the wear and tear on, on your faculty and on your staff is, uh, is brutal. And, you know, we know what has happened with mental health amongst providers. Guys, thank you for your attention today. Thanks for the discussion. Take care.